Hi everyone. Uh, again, um, uh, my name is Zoe Rasbash. Uh, welcome to our panel, Arts, uh, Creativity and Culture, Tools to Fight the Climate Crisis, brought to you by Watershed and Bristol Ideas. Um, I'm Environmental Emergencies Action Researcher at Watershed. I'm a white woman in my mid-twenties with kind of like frizzy blonde hair, um, pulled back with silver clips and um, gold hoops and a black hoodie on. Um, I'm in my living room, sat on the floor because I'm trying to get as close to the router as possible to ensure my Wi-Fi connection is solid, um, which I'm sure is giving off a slightly uh, non-professional hectic aesthetic because it's been uh, quite a hectic couple of weeks. And that's because we are coming to the end of COP26. Um, <clears throat> for those who don't know, that's the 26th UN Conference of the Parties, uh, where global leaders, civil society groups, activists, businesses are gathered in Glasgow, kind of tussling and attempting to kind of figure out how we're collectively going to respond to the climate crisis. Um, and, and I think what's really important is that rather than seeing COP26 and this kind of flash moment of international action um, as the be all and end all of, of climate action, it actually should be considered as a kind of springboard for longer term, deeper, more collaborative action that takes new forms uh, where we're all kind of participants rather than just our global leaders. Um, and that's kind of what we're here to talk to, uh, talk about today and kind of more uh, diversifying what we think about climate action as. Um, and it's time to start thinking seriously about the role of arts, culture and creativity um, as an essential piece of the complex jigsaw puzzle that we need in our climate solutions. It's gonna be complex and we need to plug lots of things together. And I think it's really important that we consider arts, culture and creativity as part of that. And that's because the climate and ecological crisis is not just a political, economic or uh, environmental crisis, but also an emotional, spiritual and cultural one as well. And, and for a really long time, arts, culture and, and media have been relegated to simply kind of awareness raising in this work, which was important, but we're kind of now past this era of where the main issue is climate denialism and climate ignorance. And it's clear when we're now trying to build solutions together that arts and culture can, can be really uh, uh, crucial to that. So I'm really excited to bring together people who uh, have been kind of doing this work in different forms um, and introduce this brilliant panel of, of practitioners who I really admire, whose work I've been so inspired by. Um, and uh, I'm so excited to be able to have the opportunity to ask them a lot of questions. Um, so, they're going to talk about their work and share insights from their experiences um, and just a reminder that we can taking questions from the audience so please pop those into the chat at any time um, so i'm now going to introduce our, our panelists and they're just going to kind of introduce themselves and their work and share a bit about their practice so i'm going to start with emma emma blake morsey is an award-winning multidisciplinary producer non-executive director of rising arts agency and bristol city council's culture board member she's a prolific visual storyteller predominantly working across photography, words, graphics, films, and events. Um, and has been training as a creative intersectional environmentalist in, in following years in STEM. She previously lived in uh, Germany as Puma's uh, global creative director and design intern, shifting their work to authentically center on representation and sustainability innovation. And as content uh, and partnerships manager for Enviral to also former lifestyle assistant editor at Galdem, Emma challenges approaches to inclusion and innovation in the spaces she works in, producing work that can be experienced um, by all, but mostly, uh, and she give, importantly, she gives visibility to and engages those from marginalized groups. So I'm gonna pass over to you, Emma. Thank you. Thanks, that's amazing. I'm so happy to be here with you all, um, particularly to warm up something that I hold very personally, really dear to me. Um, so I'm Emma, my pronouns are she, her. Um, my audio description, I am a black woman with some brown braids and twists with a nice black scrunchie that's actually falling apart, but don't mind about that. Um, and I've got these gold glasses, um, uh, gold red glasses and some gold small hoops and a green tail neck jumper on with some like really gorgeous bamboo um, frames behind me and my gorgeous uh, little monster next to me. Um, so I am really excited to be here to be honest because more recently, um, <laughs> thanks my specs, <laughs> um, but yeah more recently I've been working with um, Cabot's 
Institute for the Environment, um, who commissioned me earlier this summer to make uh, their more complex research more accessible. Um, commissioned through Rising, um, it was really to explore the power of visual storytelling for their COP26 billboard campaign, um, where I was able to create visual artwork designs that simplified a lot of the complex sustainability research by the Institute. Um, these billboards really focus on three aspects, uh, one being dry land, which impacts the lives of two billion people, um, WASH, which stands for water, sanitation and hygiene, and glaciers, really looking into the research that turns sediments from melting glaciers into sustainable fertilizer for agriculture. Um, all three of them, very unique, uh, yet delivering solutions for global climate challenges. Um, and like Zoe said, a lot of the work that I do does and focus around challenges um, and approaches to inclusion and innovation. Um, and whilst doing so, I love to figure out how we can platform um, and still give visibility to those marginalized groups. Um, so I'm working with large institutions like Habit Institute, it was important for me to consider how to widen that impact. And so we decided we would, and we will sell more eco-friendly prints where the profit will go towards organizations who are led by and actively platform black environmentalists like myself. So this especially is important when you consider the fact that indigenous people represent 5% of the population, yet protect 80% of global biodiversity. Um, and so more recently, um, I've been an artist in residence for Norris Media Centre's Come Together programme, which has been a way for me to create hybrid outdoor experiences for those um, who can join in person as well as virtual attendees and a way to connect local marginalised people with the already existing network of local outdoor groups while illustratively sharing the stories of local residents who take part. Um, it was a way for us to kind of recognise the richness and outdoor knowledge within marginalised communities and yet the barriers that make it historically inaccessible in the Western context. Um, and so uh, I've actually just come back from Glasgow um, where I was there with Enviral um, and the opportunity to connect with like-minded activists and purpose-driven leaders and organizations in climate justice and communications was a real uh, like important aspect for us but I guess most importantly it was a way for me to listen and learn to be able to take in the invaluable wisdoms from all over the world um, which informs the work we do as an agency at Enviral but also with our clients. Um, yeah, it has also been really a great reminder of what we're dealing with. Um, we talk a lot about the climate crisis, the emergency, whatever you want to call it, as if it's in the future, as if it's for some, if they have the awareness that it's imminent. Uh, yeah, but for many, it's already here. It's happening now. Um, and to that perspective, it's actually everything. Um, so I spent a long time talking about the need to bolster the Global South's ability to be climate resilient um, and whose onus it is in order to do so. Um, especially as I believe reparative justice is quite interlinked with the ability to meet any kind of global climate targets or any kind of goals. Um, but yeah, I actually delivered an extensive takeover um, about this on my Instagram. Um, so if you're interested in learning sort of facts about even just relevant stuff like the fact that more than half of historical CO2 emissions were emitted by Europe by 1950, um, and most of that came from the UK. And also up until 1882, more than half of the world's cumulative emissions came from the UK alone. Um, then definitely go do go on my Instagram, my latest Instagram uh, IGTV post, where you can learn loads more in-depth factors and stuff about intersectional environmentalism and circular economy and why all of these historical emissions matter. Because ultimately, I believe art is truly the way we visualize we learn, we listen more about ourselves. It's very expressive and it's a way to cultivate generations. Um, and ultimately it's what we leave behind for future generations to understand our point in history. Um, so with that, I love the Native American proverb that we do not inherit that from our ancestors, we borrow it from our children. And so I would hate for anyone to assume the work I do is rooted in optimism for the sake of it, because it's not, it's solutions oriented. It's about how we can we use art um, and creativity to effectively utilize and influence, or it's about how we effectively utilize an, uh, the role of art on culture to make it more digestible, make improbable concepts and parts of this very science heavy movement more accessible. Um, and by breaking it down to a point where we neither assume knowledge or lack thereof, uh, we don't oversimplify where the true impact of information is misrepresented. Um, yeah, art is a very powerful tool for contextualizing. Um, when artists are able to tap into the value of the why of what they do and understand the value of the work they give to others, that's a really culture defining tool. Um, and you could, anyone could ask, why does influence and culture matter? But de by definition, culture means the ideas, customs and social behavior of a particular people or society. 
And so sustainability discourse often touches on influence and behavioral shifts in individuals, but these same behaviors influence what we deem to be a normality in business and in governance also. Um, so I'm going to kind of leave it there as I can't wait to deep dive into this further with you all, um, but just a sprinkle of some kind of perspectives that I hold true and dear to myself. Uh, and yeah, sure, I'll post some links for sure. <laughs> Thank you so much, Emma. I feel like you spoke to so much there that, that really provokes thinking across a range, a range of, um, of, of, of topics there. That was really, really insightful. And I can't wait to revisit some of the things that you just said. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Ian Solomon Kowal, also known as KMT, who has over 20 years um, experience of leading positive social change and raising awareness for a multitude of social issues through powerful words and rhythms of hip hop music and a passion for environment and conservation. Um, with reverence to his ancestral homeland, he chose the name KMT, an abbreviation for Kemet, uh, now known as Egypt, to indicate the progressive nature of his indigenous ancestors. His birthplace in historical South London provides much of the inspiration that galvanizes his vision for an inclusive and creative future within a city landscape. KMT combines his love uh, for music and uh, Pachamama, I think I butchered that, Correct me, correct me. Uh, and Mother Earth, um, issues of global food security, local food growing systems um, to entertain and educate. Uh, Ian, I'll pass over to you. Thank you so much. Um, so yeah, um, uh, why did I have to go after that? <laughs> after that, and I was just like, wow. <laughs> um, so basically what my focus on is really about how art is using a participatory experiential way. Um, I think that there is, as, as the previous speaker spoke, said about there's always this focus on the problem and not the solutions. And, you know, um, nature is one with us. It's not a separate, we've, it's only, this is a common, common thing that, you know, nature and us are separate, nature and people are separate, nature and art are separate, but actually historically, culturally, they've always been one. And I suppose the work we do um, and the different facets of how that manifests itself is really about that. So um, the way we use art, we use it to basically, there's kind of five or six different elements of my work and the art works through all these elements. Um, and more recently, I'm actually working for Bristol Council um, and I'm actually using, how am I using art to make the conversation, make the um, engagement, make even the funding um, more applicable to people that don't really access that kind of money as well. So the art for me is used, particularly as sustainability, environmental and climate change is used throughout. It's not a separate entity. So my home is basically a project called Maple Gardens. It's been converted into um, a demonstration site to show how people can live more sustainably. And I've been working from there for the last 15 years as a community project. And um, within the home, sorry, <laughs> within the home, there's basically, um, there's art throughout the whole house. Um, so you've got art on the walls, not only that, the people actually participate in the production of that art and the creation of that art as well. So the community is central to that co-creation as well. That's very important in terms of how we work. Um, also, music in particular is used as a narrative to express, I think as a grassroots organization, um, because we're very much solution focused, we tend not to get as much, despite how many accolades and how much awards we get, we do not get as much support from other organizations. Um, and so we use art to amplify the issues and the voices and to inform policy. Um, so, for example, um, one performance of um, one of the performances I did on one of my tracks called Trees Are You or Plant More Trees um, actually informed the policy for the mayor, Sadiq Khan. So that's one example how that works. Um, if we move on to our youth programme, the arts are really important um, because we tend not to talk about the trauma experienced by people who have been affected by the results of climate change um all those kind of social issues that produ produced by the weather you know all these kind of economic issues that are kind of uh, you know impacted by basically for example we work with particularly young, young refugees and so no one talks about why they've been displaced, well, the conversation why they've been displaced and how do you try to get them to communicate those issues in a very safe and honest way 
creativity is used in that way as well. So we use a lot of creativity with young people to really explore those issues and to open them up and to do it in a safe way where they're not kind of interrogated and it's not forced. So that's how we do it with our youth at Top Garden. Then we have an event called Come We Grow. And Come We Grow Base is just a platform for just to highlight all the great work people are doing from various different sectors, particularly from black and brown communities, not exclusively, but you know, they seem to be the most underrepresented in the narrative of um, climate change. Um, so we have an event where basically it's almost like education, edutainment. So we start off with more workshops, kind of, you know, theme stuff, capoeira, yoga, plant-based workshops, whatever it means, whatever it means. And then we have a club night. And so we've even had an apple press on the dance floor of the the event you know what i mean and actually the, the waiter was actually the cocktail waiter was actually pressing that well people were pressing apple press the people again the participatory elements always there the audience were um, pressing the apples and then the, the waiter cocktail waiter was making making cocktails from the apple from the apple press that they pr pr um, pressed so that's um come we grow um and then there's the last thing is myself um because um i'm dyslexic um we still live in a very we live in a society where the written word and the, the, the written word and writing and reading are still central to where power is based. And so in order for us to dismantle to challenge that, we must challenge the way in which we see people who are the most articulate through the spoke by be able to write and read are at the forefront of this movement. So what I mean for example for that, um, I've been doing this 50 years. I wasn't even, I had to self-fund my uh, event at COP. I wasn't even approached by any organization or any individuals despite my experience. But yet, the feedback has been incredible as well. So um, I think that's really it from me. Yeah, I think that's enough, yeah. Thank you so much, Ian. That was amazing as well. Like, again, speaking to so many different ways that you have worked and that have got amazing lessons for all of us. And I can't wait to revisit what you said as well. I hope we have enough time um, to pull on all these amazing threads. Um, I'm now gonna pass over to Russell. So Russell is a cultural producer based in Durban, South Africa, who I've had the pleasure to work with before. Um, his work obsesses over the tensions in heritage, modernity, culture, and tradition as it applies to black life. Uh, his practice includes cultural research, writing, uh, creative producing, design, film, and curatorship. Um, he's uh, part of a number of working groups spread across Southern African region, uh, the African continent internationally. Um, he's shown work in Munich, Marrakesh, Maputo, Karl, Karl Zura, oh my God, I've butchered that, it's a city in Germany, um, Harare, Bristol and Tokyo, um, and throughout South Africa. And, and while this conversation has got, uh, I'm based in the Southwest and we've got um, practitioners from around Bristol and, and Western Supermare. Um, it's really brilliant that Russell is, is able to join us today, who's collaborated with people in the Southwest of the UK over many years, but is joining us from Durban um, to speak to practices and perspectives um, from outside the UK and ac across Africa, um, which mm -hmm. is, I think, essential to do whenever we're really talking about conversations around climate, but to bring in international voices. Um, so I'm gonna pass over to you, Russell. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you. Um, good evening to, to you all. Um, so so let, me get, let me get right into it. Um, it's, as, as a point of departure, I think it's really difficult for, for me to, to think about this question of, of climate justice without thinking about the expansion of the empire. You know, um, the, the the catastrophes that we that we that we see of of today um, started, you know, at, at the outset of, of the expansion of the empire. And so, when you think of of the the, the debates that are, that are kind of um, taking shape today, and of course, the continent is 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 kind of contributing quite strongly to to this. But it's kind of it's not out of our own ones and our own constructions, you know? Um, so one could, could, for example, look at a number of projects that I've been engaged with in trying to think about this um, from the perspective of this continent and how we could um, translate, digest, and reflect on this idea of climate justice. Um, also as a theme that in many ways has kind of been 
you know, lumped on onto our laps um, as as Europe and America has have have, have awakened to the to the destruction that they've been perpetuating and accelerating for centuries. You know, um, and so very quickly we need to do something about this as well. Uh, but of course, the distribution of resources are not the same. The infrastructure is not the same, and a number of projects kind of try to tease us out in very interesting and sophisticated ways. Um, the one. The one is a project that we've been kind of it's and it's it's it's, it's primarily research driven and it's looking at the at the secondhand at secondhand clothing um, as a stage to kind of politicize these neutral you know pieces of fabric that leave the shores of Europe and America as aid onto Africa yeah and what they do in local markets what they do to the textile industries in local markets but at the, at the same time they're kind of the stumping you know um the stumping of, of of materials that haven't been you know used to 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 their last days only to step into the retail space and claim more and dump more into Africa and buy more and dump more into Africa and then Africa has to, has to do something around that um, so that, that project has kind of been looking at, at how, at the, at the very so, uh, sophisticated and complicated ways through which this aid, that through the voyage becomes trade, because these secondhand clothing arrive in Africa, um, and somehow they are sold in, in African markets, in downtown markets, you know, um, and there's a, there's a discourse, I think there's a critique and, 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 uh, and a, a politicization, I think, that happens here, because somehow there are a number of agents that rethink how these how these products how these artifacts um, become useful for the needs and and the uh, occupation reoccupations of um, of african agents the other project um emerges from the drc um and it's 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 a critique at this kind of green future yeah um and kind of the the poster product um being the tesla you know, um, of course, the Tesla materials, um, particularly those that are used in, in, in the batteries and the rechargeable batteries um, and other and other elements are, are mined in the DRC. Yeah. But one has to ask himself how many people in the DRC can afford a Tesla um, at whose expense is this green future? being promised yeah um and of course you know you've you've got you've got this very small um group of people that can afford and 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 and, and will perpetuate um uh, this this idea of the green future but do not speak of the destruction the displacement that's happening down where these where these um uh, products are being are, are being extracted and mined um so the, these are some of the ways that i think artists on the continent are trying to think about these questions and trying to ground them um, in, in, in an appropriate way um, instead of being consumed in the flurry that is kind of consuming Europe around these questions of, um, of, of, of climate justice. I mean, then maybe just to close off, We've also been doing doing a bit of work um, around indigeneity and technology. Um, so on the one hand, trying to think of this continent as producers of, of technology, however, beyond and outside hardware and software. So I've kind of been revisiting um, ancient practices and sacred rituals that are, are, are kind of highly tethered and interwoven um, and connected with nature, and perhaps they are two. They are two, and I've been using language as a way to to undo this uh, this this connection um, that that Silicon Valley and technology kind of go hand in hand, and trying to introduce other ways that we can start to think about technology. Um, but and, and and it's a kind of it's it's a technology that is that is responsive. It's connected and kind of valorizes nature. Um, and so there are two there are two words that I'd like to to put forward. Word. or maybe the one is the word and the other is a, is a, is a notion. The word which is called Ubnan, and this is the word for, for in one is one asks for a ration of food, yeah? Um, and this word is devoid of debits or credits, you know? Um, it's kind of, it's an offering of a, a, um, a, a, an, essential, an essential item, and it's not expected to be returned. You know, it, 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 it's, it's kind of, it's devoid of the, the, the ways in which we think of resources, we think of, of products, you know? And so this already starts to tell us that there was a, 
there was a there was imagination that was circulating in this region that had very little to do with competition. It had more to do with collaboration, you know. Um, and as 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 we can see, at least in in this context, the people who are at, under the 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 the, 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 the tightest financial constraints are the ones that are most resourceful. You know, um, yes, they are the ones who are most impacted by these catastrophes that others can avoid through, again, capitalism, right? So you already start to see how Africa time and over again, you know, remains at, um, at, at the receiving end um, of of extraction and the complexities and complications of this. And so I'll hold it there and kind of see, we can come back to some of these ideas and unpack them a bit more. Russell, thank you so much. And I, I really appreciate that concept of undoing that you were speaking about. And I also really appreciate that I gave you five to seven minutes to talk about an entire continent. Um, so I appreciate you <laughs> stilling that down as best you can. Um, I also just realized you missed uh, doing your audio descriptor. So if you wouldn't mind, I'll pass it back to you to do a quick one. Apologies, I sure will do. Um, so I'm a black male, um, kind of shortish, <laughs> fairly lean. Um, I'm set in my study and behind me um, is a mirror which kind of projects the, my bedroom on, on the other side of, um, of my study. I'm in a kind of what, maroonish kimono um, and I'm wearing my specs at this part of the day, which is evening here in South Africa. I hope that was good enough a description. Um, fairly dark in, in, uh, in, in complexion. Thank you, Russell. I also realised, Ian, you didn't do one either. Do you mind if I pass it back to you just to do a quick one? Yeah, I totally apologise. So um, presently, I look like I'm on a spaceship because I'm on a coach. Um, so it looks quite futuristic, the background around me. Um, I'm an African-Caribbean male, um, slightly, I suppose, caramel complexion. Um, I have, I can't really see the hair, so that's irrelevant. Um, my distinguishing features are this. I have a nose ring in my nose and people comment that it looks like we're going to go fishing with it as well. So that's quite, quite an amusing one. Um, I'm wearing a hooded top, which is gray, but has color around the outside. It's kind of like, looks like an Aztec kind of jumper. So it's gray, but it's got um, patterns on, on the jumper itself. And um, I think that's it. Yeah, hopefully. Thank you. Yeah, smashed it. That was really great. Lots of depth. Um, I'll pass over to Paula now. So Paula Burtwistle, um has a technical background in live events for over 25 years and draws on this experience to help people turn their visions into reality as sustainably as possible. Uh, as green champion for arts organization Culture Western, she's produced a number of low carbon impact events during the pandemic and in February and in February she will produce her first sustainable art-led community lighting trail in Western Glow. I will pass over to you Paula. Thank you, thanks. I'm a white woman in my late 40s. I've got long bushy blonde hair. I'm wearing a shirt with some forest animals and trees on it. Um, behind me there's some sort of crazy decorations and 70s wallpaper. Um, as you said, my background is much more the technical side. My practice is kind of sound and lighting, and it's very much supporting art and, um, and, and using creativity through that, using my role to find creative technical solutions. Um, I've always enjoyed the camaraderie and the teamwork and the sense of satisfaction that comes from working in the arts and with incredible people. But um, I've had a nagging sense of guilt and conflict for years and years about the power that we burn and the resources that we use and all the miles that we travel. And recently, last five years, really struggled in justifying whether I can even do the work that I do when the world's in such a crisis. Uh, so the last few years, I've been really making a change from doing some sort of like some more corporate work where you have bigger budgets and shadier morals and really steering my work towards more meaningful local work. So I've been working with Outdoor Arts and Culture Western in Western Supermare, also with uh, inclusive performance with Extraordinary Bodies and Diversity with um, amazing companies. And I'm starting to make peace with the work that I'm doing and looking to the future and seeing how to keep moving in that direction. Um, it really helps that a lot of it's local. And I'm starting to see work that seems to bring a change, like it actually brings different sets of emotions to people in their locality and work that's more outside based. Um, I've done quite a bit of activism with Extinction Rebellion. I feel like the last few years have been really pivotal 
with changing public opinion and using a lot of art to do that. You know, XR, youth strikers, some of the art, the, the black and white artwork of the skull made of bees and moths and, and you know, an iconic pink bow. I just think these are amazing art examples of, of bringing the climate crisis to the public, but that's, that's done now. We've kind of done that bit. And I think it's really interesting to ask what happens next? Like, what do we, how, do, what, how does art communicate to people exactly where they're going next, what to do? Um, I'm really buoyed up today. I have come yesterday from an amazing residential at 101 Arts in Newbury. I don't know if anyone knows about 101. It's an incredible arts funded um, facility, like a warehouse space that enables people to come together and do research and development, work on shows, rehearse, um, build props. And for the first time ever, I think, 15 production managers were gathered there. I don't think there's ever been that many together apart from you know, the opening ceremony of the Olympics. Um, and we decided that our collective now was a dazzle, not sure why, but we got together and we, we, we went there, I think, thinking that we'd have some really easy answers, like what's the best sustainable cable tie alternative. But what we ended up with was a completely far more existential look at social justice, climate justice. And I think we're the kind of practical people that don't, always consider those things. So a real respect to the people that put together this program for us. And it was amazing to be in a space where we came to some conclusions about how we can support artists and the arts in that journey towards climate justice and social justice. And, and, and we're very practical people. So, so we've decided we want to approach it like health and safety. We want to approach it. We know that people come to us and they say, can I do this within the realms of health and safety? And we'll say yes or no. And now we're going to bring that and we're going to say, you know, how can we do this? And we're going, no, you can't. You can't do it like that. that. You're using too much power. You know, let's help you find a way around it. So we're going to embed this like health and safety. From the beginning of projects, we're going to keep monitoring it all the way through. Um, yeah, and that's, that was one of the, the big conclusions. Uh, another practical example is that we're going to offer our services. To, to 101 as a starting place, but also to other organizations to work with artists when they're first creating their work and, and offer help and suggestions and, and work as a team with them to enable people to produce green riders so that they've already thought about things in the process. And that will also then in turn put pressure on receivers like festivals and venues and events. So they're already getting some work that's had its sustainability and its impact thought about. So we're hoping that this will then, you know, that the, the pressure will then go onwards and bigger events will start to see that the artists, they care about it, the artists are, are informing that change. Um, so yeah, that's, yeah, that's pretty much me. My, my next project, as you mentioned, coming up is the Sustainable Lighting Trail in Western Supermare. That's got a focus on rewilding bugs, biodiversity and hope and I'm going to try really hard to just let nature be the, the, the biggest part of the art there and just light things up and, and work with what's already there and help people to, to, to care about what we've already got. And that's me. Thanks. Thank you so much, Paula. I, I really appreciate everything that you guys have already spoken about in that all of your work is very, very different. And what you're speaking to is very, very different, but there are definitely some themes coming up, thinking about specifically getting people to re-engage with the world around them, um, re-engage with nature and kind of get that appreciation for it. But also to things like um, how arts, culture and creativity can start to incorporate new knowledges or not new knowledges, old knowledges that, that are new to kind of the way that Western world works. Um, they're kind of sometimes kind of a bit rejected by the way that we're kind of run by Western science in the climate space, but kind of creating space for that. And also challenging, challenging um, what we think of as climate action and, uh, thinking about challenging what we think of about green futures and and and, uh, and, and really providing different aspects to that conversation. So that's really, really exciting. Um, I There's a couple of brilliant questions that come from the audience, which I'll get to in a second, but I just wanted to um, open with a question that I have for you guys, and, and you have spoken to this uh, already uh, a little bit, but um, I'll just uh, 
want to get all of your thoughts on it. So uh, Perenna Reddy, um, a New York based activist and director of public events at Queen's Museum, um, has described how people from historically marginalized communities have barriers to participate in civic processes and integrating the arts can sometimes make people feel more welcome, create more joy and interest and sustain engagement for longer processes. Now, I know from my experience that uh, the climate movement in the UK specifically has a real problem with um, embracing uh, different and marginalized communities um, and bringing their voices into the mainstream. So I wonder if you have kind of experienced the same in your work for arts and culture to play a role in kind of countering that. Um, does anyone want to want to take that? And Emma? So I've got two screens, which I I mouse across the other one as a bit of a trek. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I this actually speaks to I guess the work I've just been doing quite intensively with the Noise Media Centre of the Come Together program. Um, because again, you're speaking to marginalized people who might have already existing um experiences or interests or knowledge about the outdoors or nature or the environment um yet because of the context particularly the western context might have had other barriers to actually incorporate that in, in their everyday lives even something as simple as time responsibilities that kind of impact those barriers that just actually exist for many um and so i really truly believe a lot of the approach that i've taken within that project has been trying to incorporate a real joy and love for nature, helping people to build their own first person uh, emotions and experiences with nature for them to actually form a desire to want to protect it. I feel like to go straight to that desire or straight to that expectation that people have to be in that position to have the or knowledge of the solutions to be able to embed that into like their lifestyles to go straight from zero to hundred in that way is just impossible when if you're not someone who even actually has time or ever goes out into nature or is able to ever experience the healing or the relaxing or the impact of pausing in outside in the green space if you can't if you even have a local green space why the fuck would you care <laughs> like I could understand the disconnect you might have because for you that's not pending when you might see other responsibilities as being a way fact, way bigger factor in your everyday life um, and so I think for me it's is that's the real crux of it it's like using arts using that real emotive um, opportunity to get people to really form their own personal opinion of it. I love nature because of my experiences and being around nature. I understand the value of nature because of my experience of being around nature. Likewise, I think it's, it's that's what I was talking about earlier actually, that, that assumed knowledge kind of jumping to that stage um, is where people often have the barriers um, and you kind of already neglect the masses who already do not have that connection. Um, so I think you have to kind of start from there. For many people, you talk about the masses, how like, and in order to do that, I think arts and culture has a real um, relevance and a real influence on that. Um, and then it's like building people up to then be in a position where they are able to inherently authentically want to protect it because they see the true value for nature. Um, so that's just my two, two, two cents. <laughs> no, a brilliant two cents, 50 cents. Um, does anybody else want to kind of speak to that question or respond to, to Emma? Yeah, I think it's really about, we, we talked about historically about, you know, um, the, the impact of the empire. And I think when we talk about fauna and flora, um, we, we, we have to remember that nature is the, basic, the best science lab ever, like, and also the best canvas. And so just to reinforce what Emma was saying as well, like for me, for example, my office is actually in my garden. Um, and that just throws people's heads like skewed. It's just like, but why not? We're talking about environmental justice. We're talking about all these things. Those are places that we should be frequenting in terms of actually how we do our research. But how do we do our research? Generally speaking, I'm just talking very broadly. We tend to do it in a very laboratory, laboratory way. You know, it's going to be in a room. It's going to be, and it's completely separate from nature. So again, I think it's really crucial that science and engineers actually place themselves in a natural environment with artists, also in natural environments to actually do this research. And I think the answers will emerge from that process as opposed to looking for that quantitative data. Yeah, I'm looking for the A to B. Actually, nature doesn't work in that way. There's a saying that nature abhors straight lines. It's far more complex than that. So it's really important that whoever they are, not just science and engineers, immerse themselves with artists in natural environments to understand their research. 
Oh, Russell? Sure. I'll try, I'll try, try to keep it tight here. Um, so so I, I think I think as artists, we are makers of knowledge, yeah. Um, artists are able to kind of hustle themselves into a, a number of fields. And I, and I think this question is this question of climate justice um, is it it taps into the space of 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 of, um, of the academy, which have been the makers and the producers of knowledge for the marketplace, essentially, you know, at least in the most recent, in the most recent um, history. And so that has to be undone. We have to think of how we raise children, for example, kind of products for the marketplace or, you know, like to, to return to, to the fundamentals of existence, you know, um, so, so there are a number of fields that I think we, we ought to, to visit and, and I think the arts is one of the few tools that we can use to kind of open multiple doors and call and I think, you know, most of us around this table are producers and one of the things that creative producers are really good at are calling a number of people around the table and kind of sharing a question and translating a question and mistranslating it at times in order for us to arrive at new meanings at new renders and new ways of thinking and talking about things, you know? And so for me, this is, this is how um, I see the art as, as a useful way to kind of weave in and out of various fields um, of, of, of knowledge, of practice um, and of life, I guess, more generally. Thank you. Thank you, Russell. I feel like you really succinctly kind of covered what all of you do in various different ways, which is translating, digesting, bringing people together, forming these new knowledges, as it was beautifully said. Um, Paula? Yeah, just to go back to the, the nature, that's kind of, that's what I was talking about, the, the lo working locally um, is really honed for me. Everything that we've Got locally, we've got we've got sea, we've got woods, we've got um, you know all, all the natural resources that we have very close, and it's been a real pleasure. And I think something that we're trying to continue at Culture Western is to tempt people out into these spaces, and then once they appreciate those spaces, they're going to be more open to climate change and making lifestyle changes because I think you know there's still areas local to us. There's a lot of resistance to that, and. And yeah, tempting people out through art is where we're at. We, you know, we've been having things on the beach, we'll be having things in the park. And if we can bring people out and make them feel that ownership, feel that, that connection, then that's, that's how we're gonna do the next steps. And that's how people are gonna care enough to make changes that they might not want to be ready to make just yet. But yeah, let's hope they do. Thank you, Paula. Um, amazing also, you guys have got such great contributions. I'm now gonna um, throw to a question from our audience, um, from Anne, um, who said, who's asked us, this is an open question. I want to ask whether you feel that the, a lack of imagination and fear of change are real problems when it comes to finding solutions to climate change and how art and creativity can tackle fear and resistance to systemic change, some of those more systemic changes that we need to see. Um, does anybody have any thoughts or responses to that? It's a big question when it comes to talking about fear um, and then how we tackle it and how we hold it. Um. Well, um, my album that I launched at COP is called Fear of a Green Planet. Um, so, you know, this is crucially what we, we, you know, we're, we're dealing with. And the, the context of that comes from Public Enemy, who are one of the pioneering revolutionary hip hop groups. And I've kind of, kind of just usurped that, I've reinterpreted that to mean a fear of a green planet because there is a constant fear of uh, this notion of even engaging with nature historically. So I live in the UK, you know, any association with anything green in life, for example, even piercings was associated with tribalism or being backwards or being kind of, you know, like all these kind of things as well. But yet now everyone's adopting these narratives, you know, everyone's doing yoga, everyone's doing spiritual work, everyone's, do you know what I mean, saying namaste, do you know what I mean, like, you know, like, and they're making money off of it. And it's like our ancestors in our culture were kind of doing this years ago, and they were demonized for this as well. So I think one of the things that I do a lot is fun. I have a lot of fun with my music. So for example, I have a track called Litter, 
although it's called Fear of a Green Planet, you know, it, it, it's quite sometimes quite a it's a complex issue, and it's so layered. And so, in order to engage people, it's really important to meet them where they're at. And I think humor is a really good way through creativity to do it. So my track litter, for example, um, it's me talking about walking in a park, um, and I slip in some dog poo. Do you know what I mean? And I'm like reacting to it and I fall over and I'd like, you know, it's stuff like that for me that works really well in terms of just breaking down the fear and also the kind of um, the change, the behavior change. Because if whenever we tend to force, we want to coerce, we want to, because we know, we assume that everyone else knows and we try to force people on our journeys. But actually that's not going to get people to where they need to get to make change. They need to have ownership and agency of that. So I use a lot of fun within my creativity to, to do that and participation as well. So with Litter, for example, it's actually a Litter Pick as well. So we sing the song, we perform it, and actually people are going on Litter Picks as well. You know, that's what I'm really trying to do with all my work with music. So that's why it's called Fear of a Green Planet. I hope that answers some of those questions. No, definitely, definitely. Very, very relevant to the question. Um, I wonder if any of you also have some thoughts on, on, on the role of arts and culture and kind of encountering fear um i know uh that uh, a quote that i've been thinking about is uh, talking about how much shame there is around uh climate and environmental movements and how that puts people off because it seems like there's a real culture of shaming people for individual choices and not recognizing the systemic barriers to action and i think um shame and fear all of this is kind of held together which makes people resist change for sure i know i do it as well i'm like oh god can I go into work with I forgot my reusable co coffee cup this morning is everyone gonna think I'm a loser um but if if nobody has any other thoughts on that uh oh Emma please um I mean I guess in terms of like reimagining I think it's really hard to because we live in a society if you when you look globally which is so indoctrinated by a very particular narrative which tells us everything that we are working on that we commit our day-to-day -day lives on is impossible <laughs> that it's not going to be feasible that it won't happen and so I think really actually we need creativity we need the arts because we need to reimagine a completely different reality to one we are living in and I think I honestly someone really poetically wrote um said this when one of the talks I was at the other day um during COP um and they just can find a little note of it but um because it was just incredible but I think what's so interesting is that we are so often told that it's not possible and I think the idea is is that with art and creativity you're able to actually translate whether or not the ideals of what we need to see and be able to do in a way that can be malleable that can be experimentative I think even science itself I think the idea that we view art and science as separate and it can often be quite harmful because if science isn't just adults playing and having to reimagine and having to explore and having to experiment to find solutions and to find fact-based stuff through experiments, if that's not linked to play and being creative in a certain way with intelligence, with knowledge, with whatever, I mean, that's when we start to differ from opinions. I don't think, and I don't think we need to ever separate the two in reality because I feel like we need art to inform that creativity. And I say art by really like creativity, that creative viewpoint, or creative perspective is so intrinsic to how we approach it. Um, and I think they said, um, the quote that I was looking for, actually just found it, it says, uh, we know change is coming. Is it going to be eco-fascism fascism or green colonialism or rooted in solidarity? We have to reimagine a future. They've erased our memory of our struggle and how change happens. And I think that's really vital and speaks to how we need to figure out another way to exist. And I think, it's very true that fear um, and real fear of uh, problems and people making systematic changes is inevitable. People aren't, change isn't necessarily going to be comfortable. And I think that's what people really struggle with is just the idea to communicate that. And I think actually, instead of painting it as a thing, you're gonna lose everything. Why can't we see that there's so much to be gained from a greener world? There's so much more to be benefited from changing our lifestyles. And it's not about losing or, being at loss from something I think that's what's really that's what really excites me um is that actually we have every opportunity to build something incredible um and to really 
strive for something that's even greater than what we actually exist in and I know through the pandemic I think we've all seen that what systems we've had existing particularly in the western world just doesn't work it's not sustainable and I don't even mean that in terms of like materials I literally mean that in like existing the way in which you get burnt out like as a lifestyle it's not sustainable and I think it's not healthy and it's not doable and I just feel like it really the, the narrative what we talk about is actually should be rooted more so in actually what can we gain what more can we gain from a greener future and not just what are we going to lose in order to do so i hear here and i feel like it's something um i'll just pass you a sec all of it it's like yeah capitalism wants us to kind of shrink ourselves down and a scarcity mindset but we can imagine in abundance and i think that's something really important that creativity can do thank you for sharing that quote it really really it's true and um, paula i'll pass to you yeah, just a really practical level. That's that's sort of my bag. <laughs> in um, in North Somerset, we've just had a, a competition that we launched called Picture This, aimed at children. And we in North Somerset, we've got a really um, pretty ambitious car, a carbon neutral target for 2030 set by our council, which is pretty out there and fantastic. So this competition that we've um, been enabling with Culture Western was aimed at children, asking them to draw and write about what it's going to be like to live where they live in 2030, because we will be carbon neutral. So it's been, it's been really amazing to see because we've just gone straight to children. They are not so constrained by the fear and some of the systems that we all are already programmed into. They, there's some children in primary schools and a chunk of their life, like a quarter or a third of their life, there weren't really any planes or cars things really change in the pandemic, their whole lives are completely different. And they're reflecting this like cycle-based, walking-based, just very different local future. And they're drawing these beautiful pictures. Uh, and it was, yeah, it was really, it's really using art to cut through that fear because it's, it's almost catching them before the fear has got to them. Yeah, before they're conditioned into doubt. <laughs> But while they still have those kind of imaginations to do anything, that that's such that's such a nice um, reflection. Thank you, Paula. And, and it's always good to have these conversations about hope because it's very, you know, it can be a very, it is a very um, sad time when we kind of count what count of what's going on around us. Um, we have ten minutes left, and we've got some great questions that have come in. Um, I hmm, do, do, do I want to ask a quick question um, about uh, so we have we had a question that came earlier from Jennifer, which was how can science engineering researchers working working in climate change and decarbonisation learn from artists and other creatives to better understand and communicate the meaning of our research? Something that Emma you spoke to just then, I think, in, in what you spoke about. But has anybody else got any thoughts on how those kind of engaged uh, in traditional maybe climate science and engineering can can better collaborate with with artists and, and use the creative practice better? It's definitely an interesting question. I think Emma raised a really good point on these kind of false binaries. Like, why do we have to see them as so separate? And I think that's when you kind of get into interesting points such as like indigenous knowledge and indigenous practicing, which is both science and art at the same time. Um, and we can learn, learn so, so much from that, especially when it comes to, you know, conservation and, and, and climate. Um, did anybody have any reflections on that? Okay, well, we can always come back to it. Um, what I will um, ask now is something that I just wanted to ask you guys myself, which is that uh, a lot of the work you're doing is really amazing and really impactful, but a couple of you have mentioned how uh, it's under-resourced. Um, so I would love to know what kind of in a dream world, how can larger cultural- and I kind of responded to that one already, but can I- Oh, my gosh, sorry, Ian. I think there's an issue with the Wi-Fi. Does that happen to everybody else, but it went really fast? Yeah, I noticed that as well. It's suddenly playing up. Now I'm in the center of town, back in the, yeah, back in London, it's all going a bit skewy, ironically. Yeah, sorry about that. No, please carry on. Um, no, I just was... Um, so I was just saying that what we were talking about nature, it's also with young children. It's a reminder of, you know, us being an artist and us watching children and how they have that fearlessness around art. And just art is everything, you know, I'm going to, and the reimagination that they do, like, okay, I'm going to go up the hill, I'm going to do this, I'm going to be this. Actually, us, we need to do that more as well. And children are a really good reminder for us to do that as well. So I just want to kind of just, 
just follow on that point that Paula was saying because that's what I really enjoy. I really enjoy working with young people because they remind me of the fearlessness of of that thing. They're not concerned about all these big concepts and titles. Actually, they just want to play. And actually, play is a really and it's so important in light of what's happened with COVID and in light of what's happened with the lockdown, like how those really important fabrics of society play a really crucial element of our socialization of us as a community has been removed. And we have to really bring these things back with almost a bit more vigor because actually these are the kind of um, the cement of our societies as well. So just wanted to kind of just fo- kind of deepen, well, just follow on from Paula was saying about children and just saying it's a reminder for us as adults to play in this movement. Thank you so much, Ian. Yeah, that's, that's a great point. We've got five minutes left, so I'm going to do a double question that I would like you to answer. If you can keep it to like a minute, that would be great. Um, so, yeah, I was going to say, uh, what kind of if you had, you know, what resources and support would you like from funders, from other arts organisations? What's the dream for you to be able to continue like your impactful work? And the second question is, um, where do where is post COP? Where do we spend our energies? Where will you be spending your energies? And where do you think that we should be um, focusing our, our, our action on? Um, does anyone want to go first? Paula, thank you. I'll I'll go because I am feeling more inspired and hopeful today than I have for ages. Like I say, just like hanging out with all those um, creative and practical people made us think that we are just gonna, we're not gonna wait for the government anymore. We are going to lead on it. We are going to lead the way in our sector, in our industry of arts, and we are gonna get underneath and behind events and artists. And we're just gonna really pioneer. And there's 15 of us, we are also starting this week a Facebook group that's a community that already exists within production. We, we might have like eight or 9,000 people who are the, the sort of underpinning and the, make, the makers and the, the doers and the production people and the power people. And we are really just gonna absolutely go for it in terms of getting together, sharing best practice so we're not all doing the work separately and then offering that out to all of our communities and artists as much as we can. So we feel like we've made this network and we're just gonna expand it out and offer that so people can really embed a model of a lower carbon way of making art whilst they're telling the story. That's brilliant. I think it's so important that we do things like this, experimenting on this local level and then spreading that knowledge, I think is such a brilliant mode of action, bottom up to counter all of the top downness that we get from, people saying that's the only way we can solve climate change. Um, does anybody um, else want to kind of reflect on that, those last kind of two quick questions, quick fire round? Um, I was going to say, could you say what the question was again? Yeah, yeah. Dream dream world, what resources would you get from like funders and other arts, arts organisations? And where are you going to be kind of spending your energies going forward? Okay, so where my energy is going to spend is literally out of nature. I mean, I'm going to be probably going to go on a hike this weekend. I think I just need to be outdoors. I really feel that I've been doing a lot of traveling. I'm really exhausted. I need to recharge. <clears throat> so I'm recharging out of nature. I'm going on a hike. And that's where I get a lot of my inspirations and just generally relaxing. Um, and I guess resources, I mean, I feel jaded as much as and as many other people, I guess, activists from COP26 and resources right now is I'm really, really keen and passionate to try and regroup um, a lot of the, but had a big, big presence at COP in Glasgow. And there's a lot of learnings that can come from there. And I would love to feel, facilitate some sort of space uh, for different artists, uh, publishing uh, organizations and grassroots communities to come together and to basically as a community, uh, local community, to figure out how we can not only facilitate a place to rest, um, but also to take our learnings and explore that together collectively. Um, so yeah, final ways basically, if anyone wants to help support with that financially, space-wise, venue-wise, whatever, I'm literally all ears. Um, so yeah, I'm very keen to find a place to rest um, and strategize and take our learnings from COP and to make the stuff we want to see happen, basically. <laughs> That sounds like a super necessary conversation and everybody who's watching this get involved. I think that's something that we could all learn from. I love the words rest and strategy being held together. We need to do that more often. Um, Ian? Ian, can you hear me? I feel like there might be a delay. I'll pass to you, Russell. Um, Yeah, I can hear you. So forgive me can you is that all right can you hear me yeah okay um so for me 
when I was talking at the beginning about the different entities that I created, um, I call it the ecosystem. So when I talked about my home, the youth project, the events, they were all done for without funding for nine years. What we focused on was people. And this is a reflection of the majority of the world. So they don't have resources, so funding. So again, um, my experience being dyslexic is that basically I've not had funding until more recently. And funding for me because I'm dyslexic means that I have to, I'm dependent on other people to produce that funding. And when the funding does come, it's normally project-based. It's not for capital costs or it's not for basically staff as well. So it takes us away from our mission. So what I'd really like to do with funding, and I'm doing this with my council role, is look at stuff like participatory grant making, which actually gives the money to communities to redistribute that wealth. We have to start redistributing that wealth. Now, when I went to COP, for example, I um, spent more time in communities than actual COP itself, because actually there was a massive exclusion of people, local people within COP26. It was almost like the rest of the world was there, but people from Glasgow weren't. So what I did was actually this concept of valuing the edges or valuing the marginal, which is what you see in nature. And that's where the most innovation is. So what I did, I spent a lot of time actually um, in communities in Glasgow. So I was in schools, I was in parks, I was in, you know, I was in community spaces. And I think if we use that money for COP to empower local communities in Glasgow, I think that would be a better legacy. If each, you know, each COP, we actually put that money to local communities, empowered them to make climate change solutions. I think that'd be a far better use of resources than flying our leaders across the world in jets. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Thank you, Ian, I completely agree. Um, I'll pass to you, Russell. Sure, so I'll try connecting to the question that was raised earlier on around um, arts as a way to, to diffuse fear and change perspectives, yeah? Um, and, and I've been asking myself whether we're dealing with the same challenges on, in, in this context, and I don't think very much. Um, in fact, the, 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 the people that are, that are, I think there's a natural, and, and also don't want to be overly romantic about this idea of like, you know, um, good old days, um, but, but there certainly is a, 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 a different preoccupation here. Um, and what you have perhaps are, are Western powers um, who are coming into, into the space and kind of eradicating green belts and displacing people at the coast because of whatever natural resources have become available, right? And so perhaps the idea is not that people have fear to change, it's something that's being imported here that is forcing people to change their lives. It's not, it's not out of their own will, yeah? Um, and, so, and so I come back to the question that you're asking now, and I, and I think perhaps it's, it's, it's about the rationale, the purpose and the intention behind the funding. I think artists like myself will kind of receive a lot of support from, from European funders, um, these, fun these funding structures come with the kind of formulated um, idea of the mandate and the intentions and so on and so forth and, and oftentimes imposed on the continent, you know, and I think perhaps it might be a question to say, here's a piece of funding, we understand that this is a burning question that we are trying to answer, how does this question make sense, how is it articulated from your perspective, and so we want to listen. Yeah, instead of coming with an agenda that's already preset, you know, so perhaps it's it's a slightly different way to, to answer your question. And then the second um, part is where am I spending my energies? I think it's it's returning to these indigenous knowledge systems that are available to us and somehow have been marginalized and displaced because of the kind of capitalist system that's concerned with uh, expansion, with acceleration and so on and so forth, you know? And so this is where I'm kind of constantly trying to, 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 to excavate um, and, and, and place, and, yeah, and place, I guess, uh, in, in, in a public domain so that we can be reminded once again of alternative ways of being and relating to the world and life, all kinds of life for that matter. What a beautiful note to leave that on. I think we could all do with doing a bit of that and returning uh, to Indigenous knowledges. Thank you, everyone. I know we've overrun by three minutes. Um, I, that was such an inspiring panel. I've got so much to think about, and I just really appreciated how it moved from you know, individual action to local impact to also recognizing the systemic inequalities and histories of, the, of colonialism as well and holding all of this together as part of a discussion. I think that was very it was beautifully done and, and all of these parts of this conversation are, are really important. Um, thank you so much.
um, and to all of our wonderful panelists for sharing your thoughts and experiences. Um, I will close that now and so everyone can enjoy their Thursday evenings. Have a lovely Thursday and a lovely weekend, everyone. And thanks again to our panelists and to our BSL interpreters. Thank you guys. Bye.